G'day. Well, today is episode 12 of the Solar and Battery Training Series. Today's a special day because I've got a guest panelist, Simon Chan from Power Plus Energy. Some people call him Mr. Lithium because he knows so much about lithium batteries and uh, he's the electrical engineer behind their products. So he's going to talk in a lot of tech today about um, batteries, lithium batteries, uh, their chemistries and their uses. Okay, let's get into it. Um, this is episode 12 of solar and battery training. Wow, this has been quite a series for me every day, getting up, preparing, <laughs> presenting, uh, editing. It just basically takes up the whole day because um, I then put it up to my channel. If you miss these live or you want to share them with someone else, you can watch them on my channel. Uh, so just go to YouTube and look for the Smart Energy Lab. Search the Smart Energy Lab and you'll find them. But today um, we've got a very special guest, um, my friend and colleague Simon Chan from Power Plus Energy. Now Simon, um, some people refer to him as Mr. Lithium. He knows everything about batteries, particularly lithium batteries and electronics around them. And Simon's going to do a presentation and we'll, I'll rudely interrupt him from time to time and uh, ask a few questions that you've posted in the Q&A field. So over to you, Simon. Thanks, Glenn. It uh, feels really strange uh, talking to you guys uh, remotely. I don't know what the audio is like, but I hope you're able to hear me this morning. I decided to throw a uh, background of Perth behind me because uh, I, it's quite messy behind me. So virtual backgrounds work very well here. Um, let me start uh, my screen sharing and uh, I'll just bring up a few slides and then we'll just talk through a few things this morning. And uh, I know Glenn has given me a, a bit of a, an intro and I'm just conscious that I might not be able to live up to all that. So anyway, here we go. So, uh, so this is uh, some material that I presented last year at a conference. Uh, so I want to give acknowledgement to IDC Technologies. Uh, these are the people who sponsored the conference last year uh, in Sydney in September. And Glenn and I, co well, both of us spoke at the, at the, at the particular conference. So, so but anyway, we want to talk this morning about lithium batteries. And as I always say to people, you know, lithium battery chemistries are a little bit like soft drinks. There are many flavors to choose from. And really, there's also additional variations in, in lithium battery packaging, which gives us uh, very interesting sort of varieties. And so you need to select a flavor of a lithium battery that will match your specific requirements. And so this morning, uh, we're going to look at um, in the first part I'll be covering for 20 minutes uh, subject to Glenn interrupting and adding materials in as we go we're going to look at some common lithium battery chemistries uh, we're going to look at the electrical chemical temperature and other characteristics uh, we can discuss how they can be used for optimal performance and tips and tricks to get the best value for money um, Later on, we're going to spend some time on battery management systems. So that's the second part of what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, so the questions that we'll ask are like, what is a BMS? What are we managing? What are we protecting? What are the different design philosophies? And then finally, we'll give some more time for audience interaction for you to ask questions. Even as, you know, as, as Glenn has said, if you've got questions, post them as you go, as we go. But if you've got anything that you want to leave, Till the end, you can do that as well. Just a little bit about who am I? Uh, I graduated from the University of Western Australia as an electrical engineer. Uh, so I've got about 35 years of industry experience. And uh, I've focused mainly on product developments throughout my career. So what sort of stuff have I done? Uh, I've done digital healthcare. I've done telecommunications. I've done wireless FTPOS. Those were the days when FTPOS terminals were really clunky, you might remember then control systems, autonomous mining vehicles, and more recently, uh, we've, done, we've decided to move into energy storage. Um, <clears throat> I just love new ideas, and as Glenn and I, you know, Glenn and I love talking about new ideas, and I'm passionate about ideas that change lives. So I was given the opportunity in 2015, and I was nominated uh, the Digital Disruptor of the Year. Um, <clears throat> so because of my new focus in in uh, renewable energy, which started in 2015. I'm interested in harvesting, 
energy, how to improve efficiency, how to convert energy, how to store energy, and how to manage energy. And um, tell me if I'm moving too quickly, Glenn. The slides are, I don't know whether the frame rates can cope with all these changes, but uh, hopefully that's all right. It's looking fine, Simon, no problems. Okay, so anyway, back in 99, my wife and I purchased a house with a large north facing roof with a large basement as well, because I wanted to have a place for storing batteries. Um, at that time, as you might remember, in the 90s, lead acid was king. And so this basement is about the size of maybe two, no, probably more than that, four, four little dunny toilet sort of sized rooms joined together, if you can imagine. So that was going to be my battery room under the house. I wanted to do my bit for my kids and my grandkids. And in 2010, that was 11 years after we moved in, we installed solar. And we were an early adopter at that time, paid $15,000 for five kilowatts. We pay way less now. And that system is coming to the end of its 10th uh, year. Uh, I will lose my feet in tariffs in a few weeks. And uh, so this the system is beginning to show its age a little bit. I haven't been able to get up to the top of the roof to clean some of the panels. And you can see the efficiency on the very top panels are not as good as they ought to be. So I started seriously looking for energy storage solutions in 2015. So I spent a lot of time learning about lithium technologies. I visited Chinese cell manufacturers. I went to Australian universities just to understand what's available out there. Um, more recently, in the last three years, I've become the technical director at Power Plus Energy, which is a little business uh, that we run in Bayswater in Victoria. So those of you who are in Bayswater, uh, we, we have a factory behind the Siemens complex on Mountain Highway. Um, Okay. Simon, can I interrupt you for, uh, uh, for a second? Sure. Um, so we've got a question, uh, a couple of questions, um, which I've just answered by text, but we might want to answer them um, vocally. Uh, so there's quite a lot of New Zealand viewers uh, or attendees, and I've had the question, uh, are your batteries available in New Zealand? Yes, they are. And I believe my colleagues in, <clears throat> in Victoria are already shipping containers of batteries to New Zealand. So we just need to connect you with the right people at the other end to be able to get access to them. There's also a question from Jeremy. Um, uh, you may cover this later, so don't necessarily feel that you need to answer it now. But he's asking about, uh, are you going to talk about the environmental impacts of lithium batteries compared to less lead acid? Which lithium batteries use cobalt? And how can the user find out where it comes from? Okay, that's maybe we'll jump a little bit ahead because that's, that's a little bit of a leading question. It's actually quite an interesting one uh, because I'm going to be talking about lead acid in a few seconds. Uh, there's always this, uh, uh, I suppose, discussion about the fact that, uh, I'll just pause the screen share. Um, there's a lot of discussion about whether lead is actually cleaner than lithium in the sense that because lead is more recyclable you can strip a lead, lead acid battery there are lots of people who do that for a living lots of companies who do that for a living they take out the plastic take out the lead uh, plates and then they recycle those um, as you will see in the presentation very shortly um, there are many types of lithium batteries and some of them for instance the ncm the nickel cobalt manganese batteries they do contain cobalt and so recycling uh, is more of a challenge, although there are companies all over the world that are beginning to move into this space. And even Tesla and other big users of, electrical, uh, of EV batteries are looking at how to recycle these uh, precious uh, elements uh, for reuse and so on. Uh, my personal choice, as you will see shortly, is to use a type of lithium battery called lithium ferrol phosphate, which, are, which I believe to be environmentally cleaner. Um, so I might, I might click back to the presentation if that's all right, Glenn. Yeah. Okay. Excuse, excuse me when I switch, sque switch screens. I'm still learning how to drive this thing. <laughs> Here we go. So the question has often been asked, you know, are uh, lead acid batteries finished? Well, they're still a rechargeable energy storage. And because of lead acid battery, we've been able to see so many things in the world that previously were not possible before. And it has dominated energy storage for a long time because of its ability to deliver power in a robust sort of a way. And the relative low cost of lead 
acid-based batteries is always the great strength of this technology. Um, if you treat them well, you can, you know, they will run for a long time. And I can still remember um, people who have told me that they've had lead acid batteries running in their shed for 15, 20 years because they've not, you know, they haven't really dipped into the batteries uh, 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 too deeply. They haven't really exceeded the depth of discharge to damage the cells. Uh, but, but, but of course, to have such batteries, you end up having to have really huge systems. Um, you do need to look after their temperature so that lead acid batteries are not being stretched in terms of temperature. And so you always tend to over-engineer the batteries to give you minimum depth of discharge so that you get the maximum longevity. Uh, what are the downsides? Well, they're very heavy. Uh, you know, you think of a typical, you say a 100 amp hour uh, 12 volt battery as a sort of a reference. Uh, a lithium battery that we sell is about 14 kilograms. A lead acid battery with 1.3 kilowatt hours of energy behind it, not necessarily usable energy, but rated energy, um, you're talking about 40 to 50 kilograms. So you're three times the weight. Takes up a lot more space and requires very long strings of cells. Uh, to reach to create a large system. So not a very modular sort of solution and requires maintenance. But of course, because lead acid is cheap in many parts of the world and in many locations, even in Australia, it still has a place. Uh, oh yes, there's this point that sometimes if you've got one cell which is bulging and you need to repair that cell, it's sometimes not possible because the, it might not be uh, feasible to take out just one cell and swap it out. Now, lithium is not new, as you all know. Uh, it's been around. It was invented back in the 1980s and Sony commercialized it in 91. And it's all at that time was based on the lithium cobalt oxide cathode. Uh, so what, what do we know about the lithium cobalt oxide? Well, the nominal voltage of this particular cell is 3.6 volts. It's got about 150 to 250 watt hours per kilogram. And you need to charge them using constant current, constant voltage. Uh, so you can't just charge them willy-nilly. Uh, for instance, a, you can get some 18650 cells. 18650 is a particular naming scheme to describe the size of the cell. And these cells might be 3.6 volts with 2.6 amp hour. Uh, you can charge these cells at up to 1C, in other words, at up to 2.6 amps for one hour or just over one hour. And, but you must stop charging at 4.2 volts. You can discharge them also at 1C but you must not discharge them below 2.5 volts. Uh, lithium cobalt oxide uh, available in different form factors. Uh, you get about five to 500 to 1,000 cycles and good for smartphones, et cetera, uh, for these devices. But they do have a problem. They do have a thermal runaway problem at 150 degrees or thereabouts. They tend to uh, become very unstable due to overcurrent and overheating. And of course, the question asked earlier, uh, cobalt is inside here. And so you need to choose whether you want to use this lithium. Now, just to segue a little bit, I want to go and talk about whether lithium batteries actually safe. Um, because they can exhibit thermal runaway, high energy density and high power density combined together with a, where you've got a small fault, you can have a very big mess. Uh, lead acid battery, you have 30 to 50 watt hours per kilogram. Lithium cobalt oxide, you're looking at about 150 to 250 watt hours per kilogram. So, but because users demand a long run time, they want quick recharge, they want something to be lightweight and slim line, uh, you end up with batteries like what you have in the Note 7. You remember the Samsung Note 7? The battery had a capacity which was quite high and it contained an energy density of 245 watt hours per kilogram. But the problem is in such scenarios, it doesn't take much of a mistake to cause the entire thing to fail. Um, so we've got you know, some pictures here of things that have very high energy or power density that have resulted in very messy situations. Um, there are other chemistries in the lithium family, like lithium manganese oxide, uh, lithium nickel cobalt manganese oxide, also known as NCM, which is very common today. Uh, lithium ferrophosphate, also known as LFP, also a very common chemistry today. Uh, NCA, lithium titanate, lithium sulfur. So there are lots and lots of development happening right now, lots of new research 
going into the lithium batteries. Simon, so can I interrupt there? you there? Um, can you hold that slide for a second? Because we actually got some questions about those chemistries. Sure. All right, so the question uh, from Raj is, how do you manage lithium cobalt oxide batteries? It's the same thing. You, you, know, you need a lithium uh, battery management system to manage the upper end of your charge, especially because that's where the heat is generated to suppress the cells from getting overcharged and you have to shut down when it gets hot. That's basically the bottom line for any lithium battery management system. Thank you. Any other questions? No, that's all. Okay. Yeah, so if you talk to the guys at Monash University, they're very proud of the work that they're currently doing on lithium sulfur battery. And I think there is going to be major breakthroughs there. But the, for them, the challenge will be to build a battery management system to work with a large number of cells. Because each of the cells, so at the moment, they're low cost, they're high energy density, but terrible power density. So in order to get power, uh, you need to be able to use lots of cells in parallel. And so you need uh, battery management. And also the char output characteristics of this particular cell is not very flat. And so you need to flatten it to make it useful. Now, this is a graph that's from Battery University. You, if you go to Battery University, you can find it. But it basically ranks the different types of lithium uh, batteries by energy density. Um, now, we're going to be focusing very shortly on two lithium battery chemistries. The NCM, which is uh, what's used in electric vehicles predominantly, and LFP, which is what is used a lot in stationary storage, in other words, commercial and industrial energy storage, residential home uh, energy storage, and so on. So, it's, so in anticipation of your questions, um, what are the, some of the safest chemistries available? Well, lithium titanate offers the best safe uh, operating characteristics, but the lower energy density at the moment means that, you know, it, they, they, you need a lot of them to be able to achieve what you want. But the cycle life and the high discharge rates and so on give them a bit of an edge. Uh, at the moment, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, I think it's not quite there yet, but it will probably get there in the next 12, 24 months. Um, it's generally a little bit more expensive than other technologies, but for the benefits they offer, you know, sometimes people are willing to pay the price. What about supercapacitors, ultracapacitors? Well, there's this thing called the battery super high supercapacitor hybrid devices or BSH. And so we believe that they are already becoming commercially available. And in some ways they will offer the best that lithium batteries and supercapacities will bring. And that's high energy density and high power capacity in one. Um, but you know, some chemistries are better than others. So I want to come back to two chemistries that I tend to uh, promote a little bit more. Uh, because not all lithium bat battery chemistries are prone to fires and explosions. Um, the NCM pouch cell, which you have in the right-hand side of your screen there, uh, that's a 3.7 amp, a 3.7 volt, 20 amp hour pack, which is amazing if you think about it. It can deliver 80 amps of discharge and it only weighs 410 grams. Um, the ones at the bottom are lithium ferrophosphate cylinder cells, 3.2 amp hour, 6 amp hour, a uh, 3.2 volt, 6 amp hour, or 19.2 watt hours, and they can deliver 36 amps of discharge, and they weigh 147 grams. We use some of these, not this particular type, but we use similar uh, cells in the batteries that Power Plus Energy offers. Um, with careful management, using the battery management system, managing the charge and discharge current, managing the temperature, managing the heat, uh, you can then use them in electric vehicles. Are there any questions before we continue? Glenn? Uh, yes, Simon. So uh, Raj is asking, are cylindrical cells safer than pouch cells due to their construction and, uh, and avoid bulging? Uh, I suppose uh, we've, in my business, we've always used cylindrical cells rather than pouch cells for that very reason, because pouch cells can deform under high temperature and high discharge currents. So cylindrical cells are are constrained by the, by the mechanical design of the cell. Okay, well, let's keep moving. NCM, yes. as I said, is, uh, is what you use in your electric vehicles. Nominal voltage, 3.7 volts, moderate, well, pretty good actually, energy density, 
Uh, again, it requires constant current and constant voltage for charging, and they come in different form factors. Depending on the electric car manufacturer, sometimes they use cylindrical cells, sometimes they use pouch, sometimes they use prismatic. You can charge them relatively quickly. Uh, I mean, the recommended is to charge at no more than 2C, but I know that with the fast chargers that's available for some of the electric cars, they do higher than that, but they use very, very stringent uh, temperature management of the cells so that they don't have any problems. And they can be discharged very quickly to deliver power, 4C, and of course, you're limited by your bottom end voltage, so you, you can't discharge below 2.5 volts per cell. They can achieve one to 2,000 cycles, uh, and as I say, uh, they're good in electric vehicles. Thermal runaway is still a problem, but then 210 degrees C is not super cold, uh, it's not super hot. Um, lithium ferrophosphate is the chemistry that I tend to promote, 3.2 volts, uh, lower energy density than the, than the equivalent uh, NCM batteries. Again, constant current, constant voltage charging, again, comes in very many different uh, form factors. And you can also charge these quickly, 30 minute charge time, but you need to watch your upper, temp upper voltage at 3.65 volts. Uh, you can discharge up to 6C, but no lower than 2.5C. Uh, but with the lower energy density, you need more of these uh, to be able to achieve the same ends. Um, they do achieve amazing cycles if you manage them properly. Uh, that you find them in electrical, electric vehicles as well as energy storage. Uh, they are tolerant to abuse and suitable for our Australian environment because of the high temperature uh, abilities. Now we talked about different form factors for cells. They, as I said, we've got these cells that you would have seen before in your hobby shops and so on. These are the 18650s. 26650s are slightly larger variants. Basically the 18 in the name means the 18 millimeter diameter and the 65 means 65 millimeter in length. 26650 is 26 millimeters in diameter, 65 in length. Uh, you can do 32700, so 32 millimeters diameter, 70 millimeters long. Uh, and what you do is you have to construct them into, the, into a pack like you see in that photograph on the right hand side there. And you can see a battery management system. That's an analog battery management system there on the side of the pack. Simon, uh, we it's have a couple of questions for you. Sure, Julian. Okay, so um, Anora says, I've been on a few jobs, mentioning brand names, uh, where, the, where the, the lithium ion batteries have gone flat and they needed to um, go back to the factory. Why doesn't the BMS stop this happening? Okay, the BMS is supposed to stop the cells from over discharging. But what can happen in an AC coupled system is sometimes the voltage on the lithium battery, combined lithium battery voltage pack is too, too low to be able to crack, uh, bootstrap the, uh, the, the, uh, your charging mechanism. And, and as a result of that, the batteries need to return to, to the factory. Uh, we've experienced some of that uh, problem earlier in our, in our life as well as a business. And so what we do now is we adjust the lower end uh, endpoints of the pack a little bit more generously so that there's still more energy left behind it in the pack to crank up the system again in the event of a shutdown. Uh, we've also put in a, a cold start facility within our battery to basically take the batteries right down to complete flat state, but enough to, uh, to, to kickstart the, the inverter charger. Glenn. Okay, another question here. Um, uh, my room temperatures can get to 50 degrees ambient, um, outside can get to 47 degrees. Are they suitable for these temperatures? Sorry, I didn't hear the first temperature. What was the first uh, temperature? 50 degrees Celsius. 50 outside or inside? It says my room temp. Stop okay, so that must be. <laughs> I'm guessing it probably is, it sounds like a plant room. It's perhaps a plant room, 50. If outside it's 47 and inside is 50, it must be a plant room. Um, yes, the lithium ferrophosphate chemistry that I promote uh, can work theoretically up to 65 degrees cell temperature. So you will still need air circulation in the room to stop the cells from having hot spots, or have the pack having hot spots. What can happen, as I'll describe later on, is when you've got hot spots, 
is you've got uneven charging because the capacity of the cell is proportional to the temperature of that cell. So if you've got a string of cells, for instance, uh, where at one end the temperature is 40 degrees and at the other end it's at 50, then you could potentially have a couple of percent difference between the cell at the lower temperature to the one at the higher temperature. And so you can end up with imbalanced cells. But I'll cover that a little bit more later on when we talk about battery management. Okay, um, we have a few more questions, but I'll hold them to your next pause. Okay, thanks. Let's keep moving. Are we moving too fast? Are we are going all right? It's all good. Okay, great. Prismatic cells, you might have seen pictures of these before, but basically they're prismatic because they look like a rectangular prism, uh, like a brick, basically. Pouch cells, we've already had a question about that. They're sort of soft and I wouldn't say mushy, but basically the, the packaging allows the cell to expand in size due to temperature and other factors. And in that photograph that you see there, you can see that the, the pouch cells are connected in series and then there's a battery management board mounted to the side of that. I've seen scenarios where uh, the cells have bulged and basically done some really weird stuff, sort of warping itself around crevices and so on. So that's why that's one of the reasons why I'm a little bit reticent to use pouch cells in uh, in in some projects. Okay. Uh, discharge characteristics. We talked about lead acid just now. I just want to go back and talk about lead acid discharge voltage curves. Um, as you can see, lead acid batteries are designed for long run times. Uh, so low current, long duration to achieve the same amp hour. So when you've got a very, very short run time in the, in the minutes sort of range, the cell voltages and the pack voltage drops very rapidly. Uh, this is not so much a problem with lithium. And you will see, let me get to the graph. You can see that with lithium batteries, they tend to bundle very tightly together. Um, so you can see that at 0.5C, uh, which is at the top of the curve there to 3C, the voltage, the cell voltage difference is actually very, very minimal. It's only 250 millivolts or thereabouts. Um, lithium ferrophosphates also have a very, very flat discharge characteristic. And the best part about these battery cells is that they can be discharged to 100% depth of discharge. Uh, but they're smaller, you know, because of their flat performance, you can actually stress them pretty hard. So in this graph, you can see that at the top, the top line of the curve there is 0.2 C, and the bottom one is 17.4 C, which is, you know, so you're basically looking at a, a 100 to one um, current ratio, and you can see that the voltages are still very, very compact and tightly coupled together. So how do you maximize lithium ion battery life? Uh, one of the biggest killers for lithium batteries is elevated operating temperatures. And for lead acid, it's basically anything over 35 degrees C potentially can hurt your battery, your lead acid battery. For nickel metal hydride, uh, which is the older style sort of cells that you would have seen in your sort of cordless telephones and whatnot, 60 degrees is what they operate at. Uh, NMC cells, these are the ones in electric vehicles, they have an upper limit of about 45, and LFP, lithium ferrophosphate, they've got about 60 degrees upper temperature limit. Um, so what you have to do is you basically have to manage that in order to stop the cells from getting destroyed and damaged. Um, the daily temperature variation is not a problem for lithium. I'll show you that in a, in a graph in a few minutes. Um, but what is a problem is you need to manage the temperature variations between cells connected in series. As I mentioned earlier, when you've got cells at one end, which is 40 degrees C and at the other end is 50 degrees C and you've got a couple of percent difference in capacity between one and the other, the cell that's got a lower capacity will reach end of charge ahead of the one which is at a higher temperature, which means you end up with a situation where you have unbalanced packs and that's not good. And you have to very carefully manage the charging and discharging for lithium ion batteries because you don't want to push them into the danger zone. Um, and poor connections uh, between cells can often result in component overheating at the, at the cell connection point. Um, so battery management systems, what are they designed for? They're used to prevent certain 
uh, characteristics, which are overcharging, overdischarging, overcurrent, uh, of course, short circuit protection being a subset of overcurrent and overheating. So it's like a low cost insurance policy for an expensive asset. That's what a battery so, management system Simon, is. Simon, can I interrupt you at this um, point? Um, Simon, can we get you to just pause uh, screen sharing for a moment? I've got quite a lot of questions for you. We're at the halfway point. So maybe we'll have a little bit of Q&A with just you answering my questions or the questions from the audience. Um, so first up, Raj right, asked, sure. um, he has raised this in previous webinars, uh, would it be meaningful to rate battery life in throughput energy at a given temperature instead of cycles? I think it's always very hard to conduct uh, real life um, testing to be able to give you that sort of statistics. Because even statistics like that may not be fully meaningful. If I, if I understand what Raj is saying is that, you know, we need some sort of better comparison of, uh, of a system's performance from one to the other. Um, even your cyclic uh, calculations of how many, how many cycles you can achieve, I would say it's not always 100% um, accurate anyway, because there'll be other extraneous factors. I don't know whether I've dodged the question, I've answered it. <laughs> Fine. Uh, Anonymous says, what are the advantages of the different um, cylindrical cell formats? Um, I think it all boils down to energy packaging density is the way uh, I would see it, anonymous. Uh, you know, if, if you've got bigger cells, you can often achieve greater storage capacity. For instance, um, we've got um, two series of battery packs that we manufacture in Victoria in Bayswater. Um, one is called the Live Series. These are premium batteries that have been designed to last 10 years and they can work at 1C a charge, a 1C discharge, 0.5C charge. Uh, we've got some uh, cells, uh, and for that premium battery, the Life Series, we can achieve 3.3 kilowatt hours per 19 inch rack uh, brick. That same sized package can now store four or slightly over four kilowatt hours using a slightly different form factor cell. But that form factor cell, which is a bigger cell, uh, would not allow us to charge and discharge as aggressively. So you have to back off on your charge and discharge current for fear of overheating the cells. So every form factor has got its strengths and weaknesses. And the, the bigger a package is, the bigger the cell package is, the harder it is to get rid of the heat. And that's what you basically sort of um, uh, trading off energy density versus heat generation. I have a related question from Louis. Um, is it true lithium batteries don't charge at lower temperatures, say zero degrees Celsius? They do have a bit of a challenge at the lower end of the uh, charge, uh, temperatures uh, graph because of the fact that some of the uh, electrolytes could be in a different state. And so what you don't want is you don't want to have crystals forming inside your battery which then results in short circuits. Um, so the way to, to manage that is to soft charge them till you reach a, an, a suitable operating temperature, and that could be just 10 degrees. So you basically elevate your, your charging temperature from zero up to 10 degrees. Uh, there are several ways of doing that. One way is to use a bit of a heat mat uh, to inside the battery pack itself to keep it thermostatically controlled so it never drops below 10 degrees C. Another way is it typical, in a typical sort of um, uh, environment, uh, you will find that in the room anyway, it's not going to go down to zero degrees C uh, in a typical sort of usage environment. Okay, one more question and then we'll go back to your presentation from David. Um, the LFP cells that you use, uh, you quote 1,000 to 6,000 cycles. Why such a huge range? What's going on for the 1,000 cycles? Okay, there, there are several things that affect the cycle life of a pack, of a battery pack as well as battery cell. One is the operating temperature. The other one is the depth of discharge to which you will allow your battery to go. When you sort of stretch the upper and lower end of each uh, using an LFP, 
beyond 3.65 volts at the top end and drop below 2.5 volts at the bottom end, you will get a lot, you get longer run times, but at the same time, you're aging the battery prematurely. So you're, you can end up with a situation where the, the, the performance of the pack will be at the lower end, at the 1,000 cycles end. And even 1,000 cycles uh, over, if you do it on a daily cycle, you're still looking at about four years worth of cycles. And so even if you aggressively bash these batteries, you're still, they are still performing reasonably well. However, if you treat them well by monitoring your upper uh, temperature limit, upper charge voltage limit, and your lower voltage, you will get your 6,000 or more cycles. Uh, it translates on a daily basis to pretty close to you know, 10 plus years of uh, daily usage. Thanks, Simon. Back to you. I'm having some internet connection problems. Are you guys having really choppy audio or anything? There was a few, a few minor hiccups, but we got the gist of it. Don't worry. Okay. It's, uh, I don't know whether my, the NBN where I am at this time of the day can get a little bit flaky because everyone starts doing whatever they do. And uh, anyway, we'll keep moving and hope uh, we can continue without any challenges. Okay, so as we were saying previously, uh, battery management systems are there to help manage the cell balancing and the matching. And uh, there are different types of BMSs. There's analog BMS, there's digitally controlled BMSs. And I'll talk about this in greater depth uh, in the next bit. Uh, but there are some, just a few um, helpful hints for those of you who, who are sort of academically interested in using cells. Uh, lithium batteries cannot typically be connected in series without external BMSs, simply because of the cell uh, differences. And uh, so what happens is that if you try to charge a battery pack without BMS, the chances that you will have certain cells within that pack that will reach an overvoltage condition. Uh, un unmatched batteries in series can result in really bad core capacity performance. Think of a bunch of bottles connected by tubes in series, and you've got different uh, bottle sizes, uh, the bottle which is the smallest in the, in, the, in the arrangement will always dominate the performance of the rest of the pack. Even though you might have a two litre bottle in series or the one litre bottle, so to speak, your one litre bottle will be the one that will be a limiting factor. So it's the same with batteries. Uh, warmer cells generally would mean you've got a higher capacity and therefore you have to try to connect your series, your series connected cells to a small, so that they don't have cell temperature differences. Um, I'll just jump over this because this is just really this without doing what I'm doing now. So we're now heading into part two. So Glenn, do you want to um, say, ask any more questions, pass on any further questions? Okay, I'll, I'll ask a couple more. Um, uh, so Nelson asks uh, a two-part question, are LFP round cells going to deliver the price and life cycle advantages going forward? Um, and part two is what is being done to reduce battery degradation going forward? Okay, the, just for your information, I've had news coming out of a certain part of Asia outside of China where there is cell lithium ferrophosphate cell dumping taking place. Uh, what's happening is a lot of electric car manufacturers uh, offloading cells that are below par onto these uh, uh, stationary storage markets. And some of those cell prices are extraordinary because they're almost as low as one third of the price that we're currently paying for our premium cells. So what's what I'm saying is that it is possible to use cylindrical cells and get good pricing, but you may not be able to get good performance out of them. So there's always a trade-off between price and performance. You get what you pay for. And um, so at the moment, I'm guessing that we are seeing a trend downwards uh, towards the sort of levels that people were predicting of uh, and, and when analysts were writing their papers several years ago, I was talking about the cost of cells getting lower. Well, we're watching, we're seeing that happening now. The challenge is 
whether those cells are actually of good enough quality to be used in uh, energy storage systems. We're experimenting with a few new suppliers and I'll tell you more next year, same time, same channel. <laughs> Sorry, I missed uh, the second part of the question, Glenn. No, that, that's, that's fine. So um, Raj has, this is the last question. You can go carry on after this one. Um, Raj asks, um, have you measured the cell temperature for Power Plus battery modules operating at a normal discharge? I can show you graphs in a few minutes and you'll see live data. Great. That's, that, that will be even better. Okay, now we're in the second part and uh, we want to talk specifically about BMSs. So what is a battery management system? Well, basically as a minimum, a BMS must protect against these things. Cell and pack over temperature, cell over voltage. In other words, you must not overcharge your pack. Uh, you've got to manage your pack so that it doesn't over discharge. And you also have to stop the currents from exceeding certain limits. So that's what your BMS does. It keeps the cells, it also keeps the cells in balance within the pack. So what I said earlier about, you know, you've got a two liter bottle of water connected in series with a one liter bottle of water. What we're trying to do is to make sure that you somehow stretch your battery capacities, your cell capacity as much as you possibly can within the pack. Um, they perform a very important safety function against fire and explosion. Now uh, our batteries, uh, our, our 120 volt battery went in for uh, to a test lab for certification earlier this week. And part of their test was to do short circuit protection and to make sure that the thing will actually protect itself in the event of a catastrophic fault. Well, the, um, because what you don't want is you don't want a fire or an explosion. So they were quite surprised at the speed of our BMS response time. It's in the, in the well, in the low, in, in the 50 to 100 microsecond response time mark. So you can short circuit something and you hear a slight click and you, the BMS is shut down already. Um, so they were quite surprised because they've seen some battery packs where you do a short circuit and there's sparks flying in every direction. Um, so it really depends on how well you design your protection mechanism to avoid a fire and explosion. Um, it's a way BMSs provide you with a low cost way of extending the life of a battery pack. Now over temperature, as we've said already, is very bad because it can cause your cell to degrade in performance. And therefore you need to shut down charging or discharging when over temperature is, is achieved, when you reach that stage. And um, more sophisticated BMS will not just execute an on-off control strategy, it will actually do current management and so on as well. Um, so if there's a non-uniform battery temperature rise, as we talked about earlier, you can have cell capacity variations across a pack. And so it's important that you have management systems which observe this and take appropriate action. Um, over voltage is bad because it can cause structural damage to the cells, uh, the growth of crystals and so on, leading to internal short circuits. Um, an over voltage cell often will not be able to recover. And so it's important that you stay within your operating region of that cell. Under voltage is very similar. Uh, sometimes when people over discharge their cells, what happens is that, that cell can reach zero volts, but worse still, it can become reverse polarized because of all the other cells around it. Um, and at beyond this point, it is irreparable. Um, so your battery management system needs to observe all of this. Um, I'm skipping through pretty quickly, just very mindful of the time um, because I want to show you some graphs, as I said earlier. Uh, managing overcurrent is important because every cell has internal resistance. And those of you who are electrically inclined, and I'm sure most of our audience here is today, uh, this thing called I squared R losses, which is a power loss res resulting from a resistive element within an, an, a, a, a component, uh, that I squared R loss uh, is, a, is something that creates heat inside a cell. And so therefore, as the current increases, the heat increases within the cell according to the square law. So twice as much heat is generated. Uh, sorry, four times as much heat is generated than the current, twice as much current. I'm not explaining this very well. Um, 
the thermal runaway can take place in some chemistries uh, when overcurrent takes place, and that's when you have catastrophic cell failures and fires can result. Uh, balancing cells is very important, but not so much during discharge, but certainly during charging, because as you increase the, uh, the state of charge of a cell, the voltage of the cell begins to increase, and you need to keep all that sort of managed so that um, you don't have uh, imbalance in the pack as for the next round of discharge. So you can see in this graph here, um, basically you've got a very flat region which is bounded by those blue, uh, the green dashed lines. Um, at that, in, within that region, it is very hard to be able to balance cells because the cell voltages are pretty much all in the same band together. Um, so between the 10% to 90% state of charge range, the lithium cell voltage is very stable. But you might remember that from the, in the first 10% and the last 10%, there's a rapid rise in voltage, uh, which I think the next graph shows. Um, you've got those two red called region there. And those are regions where you can do cell balancing to keep your cells uh, voltages capped and under control. Um, LFP cells will tolerate a bit of overcharging up to you know, 4.2 volts. Uh, but NMC cells will not tolerate that at all. Um, and um, so you really want to avoid overcharging as much as possible. Um, so everything to do with a battery management system is really to protect your assets from getting damaged. An analog BMS board, which you can buy quite cheaply from places like China and so on, they basically use analog voltage comparators to look at things with a, to see whether the pack has become too hot, too high in voltage, and whether the voltage is too low and so on. They use as comparators to do that. And they use MOSFET transistors to turn on and off the charge and discharge circuits based on these conditions. When you're in the sweet spots, when your temperature is good, voltage is good, current is good, the MOSFETs stay on and you can use this pack easily. Um, and by balance, during the balancing process, the um, the analog battery management system looks at a threshold, and if that threshold has existed, they turn on a chunk resistor to divert current around the cell, and that's how balancing takes place. When that voltage across that cell drops below a certain level, the shunt resistor is removed. It's very rudimentary, but it works. It's cheap, and it works. Um, and this analog, these analog BMSs work best for short strings of cells, you know, like four cells, will give you 12 volts, eight will give you 24, 16 will give you 48 and so on. Um, but you turn to a digitally controlled battery management system because you need the high accuracy in voltage and current conversion. And so you can detect over temperature more accurately, detect over voltage or under voltage and so on. Same deal, but just greater level of accuracy. And you can use signal processing algorithms to modulate the charge and discharge to keep the battery in safe zone. Uh, the cell balancing algorithms can be more sophisticated to, to keep the cells happy. Um, so there's this thing called passive cell balancing, another thing called active cell balancing. Passive balancing uses resistors. Active cell balancing uses transistors and capacitors to move cells around. Um, I'm sort of rushing a little bit. I might stop at this point, Glenn, and take more questions, and then we will look at the uh, some graphs from a live system. What do you think? Yes, if you just want to pause your screen sharing, and we'll just, uh, uh, I'll ask you, I've got about six questions here. Uh, yeah, it's five questions. So Nelson asks, uh, is the Power Plus BMS active or passive balancing? We're using passive balancing at the moment, but we have plans to have active balancing down the track, not the current generation. Um, Wilfred asks, are there BMS systems that measure energy in and out, or do they just work on voltage levels? Uh, all the smart BMSs will do what they call Coulomb counting, which is counting the number of milliamp minutes, I suppose that move in and out of a cell. So effectively, that's your state of charge because it's, it can, say if your cell capacity is five amp hours and you can count how many milliamps and how many minutes have elapsed rapidly and do counting, you can tell when your cell is fully charged. 
And of course, your, your cell voltage would always follow that curve that we showed on the graph earlier. I'll show you a live curve in a few seconds and then we'll, we'll be able to explain this a little bit more. A couple more. So Anonymous says, why do some manufacturers balance in the top end while others balance in the low end? Which is better? I think it all comes down to the particular designer's preferences. Uh, we use top end balancing because we find that it works better in our batteries, but there's no reason why we can't use bottom end balancing. I, 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 it's all to do with the particular designer's preferences. Cool, all right, back to you. All right, so what I'll do, if you give me a few seconds to uh, shuffle my screen around. Uh, and while Simon's just bringing up his shared screen, um, I'm answering some of these questions, so Simon actually doesn't have to answer every single one. So um, apologies if you don't get your questions uh, all asked of Simon, we are limited by time and we've had uh, nearly 30 questions so far. So it's a very, very good engagement. Thank you. Okay, I don't know whether you can see this. Um, this this is a live system that we have out in Byron Bay. Oh, I forgot to attach the photograph of the site. This is a beautiful site. I can Sorry, see it Glenn. perfectly. This is a beautiful lot of graphs, if you ask me. So I'm happier with this. <laughs> okay. What we're looking at here is the performance of a battery rack at this location, which is at a high end accommodation facility. Um, this is the last. 48 hours of data and it's constantly being refreshed. Um, so this is the Western Australian time zone. So if you look at it now, it should say it's now 9.52 a.m. in Western Australia. So 11.52 in your part of the world, in, in New South Wales anyway. Uh, you can see that the, this, this particular system consists of eight packs of batteries and you can see the battery pack voltages uh, on the right uh, at where I've highlighted and you can see the individual battery pack current here. So I can turn on one pack and see how it's performing, or I can look at the entire rack. So the, the third graph, the graph down here, gives you the cumulative current flowing into the batteries. Uh, what I want to focus on this at this time is we had a question that came in uh, overnight, I believe, uh, Glenn, uh, where somebody was asking about whether we can use a voltage reading to identify the state of charge. Um, what we have here is we are looking at the voltage rising yesterday around 2 p.m. on site when the sun is shining brightly and the, and the household load is reasonably low. And so the batteries were able to reach full charge. So as you can see that, the, you can see on this part of the curve where my cursor is, that the voltage rises very rapidly. And and then what happens is when we hit that upper end of the voltage, then the balancing uh, system kicks in and keeps all the cells balanced. Now we define this voltage, 140 volts, to be our 100% state of charge. By using your graph down here, the total uh, current graph, you can then count your coulombs or your amp hours and work backwards from this 100% and count back to 0% so you know that uh, your cell or your pack has reached the end of its capacity. I'll just bring you to this particular screen here. Just now we had a question about uh, temperatures. Now this is the temperature one graph is the temperature variation within the rack. So what you have is you've got different packs of batteries and they're all within five degrees of each other. And uh, so the you can see that at the, in the evening, or in, early in the morning, uh, the temperature in the room and the battery pack reaches a, a minimum. And when the batteries are being charged aggressively, they reach a maximum around here. So you can see there's a variation of about five, six degrees from minimum to maximum. Um, Simon, can I ask a question about these graphs? Um, are we looking at some special monitoring equipment you've installed at the site? Yes, uh, the, all the smart battery management systems that are in the Power Plus energy storage batteries uh, are fitted with uh, a lot of sensors. So we can actually see the performance of the system 
literally every 15 seconds. Uh, and this data is then uh, compressed and then pushed into the cloud and visualized in graphic format like this. So you can see what your, what your system is doing. Now we talked about earlier the, um, the temperature in the battery pack. So the battery pack itself doesn't actually change much in temperature through the day, even though externally the temperature in Byron Bay may drop to maybe 10 degrees overnight and crank up to 20 odd degrees during the day. Um, but your battery just stays pretty static and constant throughout that time. And we've got a few other temperature sensors here, which allows us to see the temperature of the, of the heat sink. And then down here is the a, uh, actual balancing circuitry temperature. Now you can see that when the cells are being balanced, we have to dissipate heat. We've got to get rid of the heat uh, in the, in the uh, we've got to convert the wasted energy into heat. And so you can see that we've got a soft temperature threshold on our back balancing resistors of 50 degrees C, but it doesn't actually become a problem until you hit 75 degrees C. So we were well within the operational performance of our, of our battery pack. Um, so with time running away, some of the other things that you can see is you can see how the system is performing in terms of uptime and so on, how long the system has been running and all that sort of stuff. So this graph here might be of interest to some people. The battery, uh, you get, we're actually going to drill in to the, the battery cell uh, voltage. So I just want to look at this little region here. I'm going to zoom in. This is going to take a little while to rebuild, so I'll just waffle a little bit. Um, Basically, our system allows us to drill down to the individual cell strings within the battery pack. On the right-hand side, you can see the individual cell, temperature, cell string temperatures of all 40 strings of cells. I think most of the battery management systems that I've seen on the market don't produce that sort of data to be able to allow you to analyze uh, your system performance. Um, I'm just very conscious of time, Glenn. Uh, are we going to be running out of time while this graph redraws? Because it's a live data, it takes a little while to come down. How about I ask a question while that live data is streaming? Uh, so we've got um, anonymous asking warranty. Does it cover labor on travel? Um, why is the N70 only five years? Uh, is there any fine print we should know about? I will leave the warranty questions to the sales and marketing team because my understanding is that all of our batteries carry a 10 year warranty. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's back to base warranty. Uh, as, so we don't cover the transportation because some sites, as you can imagine, could be in the middle of whoop whoop. And um, so it's, it's just the real, real, uh, being realistic about what you can warrant and what you can't. Okay, um, back to you. Look, don't worry about running a little bit over time. Um, this is a very, very engaging uh, presentation, Simon. Okay, now we always talk about cell balancing and perhaps you've never actually visualized what cell balancing looks like. Um, so this is an opportunity for us to see it in, 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 a, in a charge cycle that was about 24 hours ago. Now what we have here on the left-hand side is the voltage of the cells uh, leading up to the up to the 100% state of charge. You can see how the voltage from 10.30 a.m. Perth time to about 11.30 Perth time, that's the x-axis on the bottom there, the temperature sort of went flat and then it started rising rapidly. And then between 11.30 and 12 o'clock, you can see that some cells went higher than 3.5 volts, while some are still catching up. Uh, but what we're aiming for is 3.5 volts per cell on average, right? So what you see between 11.30 and 12 o'clock is that the cells are being balanced. They're be converging towards a, a requested cell voltage of 3.5 volts. Now, the reason why we're seeing all these squiggly lines is the household load and the charger does not deliver DC it's not a DC load, basically. So there's things going on and off. So you see the cell voltages, and we're only looking at probably um, between each, um, in, within the cell, we're looking at a 50 millivolt variation. So you're looking at tiny, tiny little variations in cell voltages, which our battery management system is feeding back to us. Um, but what happens is, 
when, when your cells are well balanced at the end of your charge cycle, on this charge, you see how, how, how they stay converged all the way down here. Um, the, the voltage of the cells stay within 50 millivolts, which is quite amazing considering we've got 40 strings of cells um, totaling 128 volts, all working hard to deliver as much power as possible. But anyway, so coming back to this, I just want to show you this little bit here where there, there's a divergence. This is, this, is the, this is a cell balance in progress. And you will see that in every battery, but perhaps not many of you have, have had the chance to actually peer inside and monitor it across 40 cells. So anyway, so I will, I will finish here and uh, I'll pass it back to Glenn and uh, questions, etc. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, actually, you've answered all the questions. I've answered a few by text. Uh, just a, a little plug for Simon's company, Power Plus Energy. Uh, they're based here in Melbourne. They actually manufacture in Melbourne. There's not a lot of companies that manufacture lithium ion batteries in Australia, but Power Plus Energy is one of them. They've been for around for a long time. I've got many of their battery modules here at my lab and I really love them. I love the fact that you can use them in a self-managed way. Um, they'll work with most of the inverters that I've got here. If it's a 48 volt inverter, it works just fine. Um, I've actually built some very big systems with these, like 300 kilowatt hour packs, so they scale well, as, uh, really well as, uh, as well. So we're going to wind it up um, today. Um, so once again, thank you very much, Simon, for getting up early in Western Australia and, and uh, dealing with MBN and other issues and the old dog that would try to bite your ankle. Um, <laughs> so we'll um, re return tomorrow for the last in this series of solar and battery training. And tomorrow we'll be talking about electric vehicles, electric vehicle charging. So please feel free to join us again at 11 o'clock tomorrow. So once again, um, thank you, Simon. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, and it's good to have so many of you watching. I have no idea what the stats are like, uh, but uh, it'll be interesting to find out. Okay. Okay, have a great day, everyone. See ya. Thanks to everyone who turned up on this weekend for episode 12 of Solar and Battery Training. Tomorrow, which is the last in our series in Solar and Battery Training, we're going to be looking at EVs, electric vehicle charging systems. And we've got a panelist, Ryan Hammond from Sealed Performance Batteries, joining us to enlighten us on EVs and electric charging. Okay, see you there.